So um, again, so an activity that, that people could do in their beds without exerting too much, um, you know, in the way of stress or anything. So uh, there were different kinds of um, activities, including uh, embroidery, beadwork, knitting, leather and woodwork, soapstone carving, uh, basketry, weaving, hooking, drawing, painting, needlework, crochet. So all these forms of craft work that, that were really promoted in those um, institutions. And they were really important to the running of the institution as well. So um, uh, though the uh, articles that were made by patients in the sanatorium were sold um, to, uh, to different craft shops or to people visiting the hospitals, they were displayed at fairs and at uh, shopping malls in Winnipeg. Um, and it was kind of a way of promoting the Manitoba Sanatorium Board, getting some money for the institution for that, for that organization as well. And um, a little bit of pin money for the, for the patients who made those articles too. So um, for example, 1960, the Sanatorium Board of Manitoba sold over $550 worth of articles made by patients. And the following year, the hospitals took orders for um, things like soapstone carvings, um, beadwork, moccasins. Um, so it was a really important part of the, the hospital experience. Um, and then to look again at this, um, the treatment, um, education, uh, occupational therapy, those two programs were also supported by uh, a program of kind of vocational treatment and this, or vocational um, training. And this was offered to obviously patients who were convalescing, who were doing well. Um, and they were invited, if they had, you know, grade eight or whatever, they were invited to go to a local high school um, to continue their studies while staying at the hospital. So they could go out during the day and they'd come back. Um, some of some First Nations people accessed uh, um, vocational training this way. Um, they also had hairdressing programs, um, woodworking for men. They're usually kind of gendered programs, so women were. Um, some were uh, supported to go into uh, nurse nurses' aid training, um, and then uh, men would go into kind of orderlies, that kind of training. Then after that period of training, they would ideally get hired in the institutions. So they had, um, they had those kinds of programs that ran parallel with the, the medical treatment um, that went on in those institutions. And it was a really important part because um, the disease comes under control in Canada um, among First Nations people in the 60s. And that's when these hospitals start to close. And when they close, many of these programs remain. So for those, the TB um, patients who'd been in the hospital for three or four years had done some education, some, some um, job training. Uh, they were invited to go to uh, like halfway houses in Winnipeg where they would stay with you know, 10 or 12 different people in a house. It was a place that you know, the, the doctors and the, the social workers who ran these programs saw as somewhere between a reserve and institution and the city and it would help First Nations people to integrate into uh, kind of mainstream Canadian society. So again, we're dealing with uh, the same kinds of philosophies of policy that Araha was talking about earlier um, in the post-war era. And so um, these they're very important because um, say uh, two really important uh, First Nations uh, groups in Winnipeg that are founded in, the, in this era, 50, late 50s, early 60s, the Indian and Métis Friendship Center. They are founded by people who were patients in those institutions and had um, kind of moved into the cities afterwards. So uh, that, that history often gets kind of disconnected from histories of what some historians call urbanization. Um, but they're, you know, they're often quite complex. So again, here's another one of their charts. So this goes 1940 to 1959. We see a steadily declining number of uh, First Nations people dying from the disease. And obviously you can't trust these figures. Um, even among the, the Manitoba Sanatorium Board's records, the figures are different for each year. Um, this, this relies on coroners to proclaim somebody as being 
um, an Indian. And uh, that, that is a decision that I'm not sure what goes into decide, like who, how they'd make that decision. Um, but also among non-First Nations people, among white people, um, tuberculosis has a reputation of being kind of a, a poor man's disease, something that happens to people who live in, con in poor conditions. So if a well-to-do man in Winnipeg died of tuberculosis and the coroner knew him, there might be, you know, a little changing of the reasons of why, of why he died, so the cause of death. So if it was tuberculosis related, you could say, you know, it was something else besides tuberculosis. So those numbers are um, perhaps artificially lower than, um, than they actually are in reality. So um, again, just a, a word on the closure of the sanatoria. This happened in the, in the late 50s and um, 1960s, basically because of the use of um, antibiotics, so the effective use of antibiotics. Um, the Sanatorium Board of Manitoba shifts its attention from tuberculosis into other lung-related um, diseases, also um, into long-term um, illnesses. So uh, also um, it gets into uh, dealing with, um, yeah, long-term rehabilitation as well and treatment. Um, also anti-smoking. Um, and uh, it's significant that they, they kind of talk about that era as the era by which TB came under control. So it was controlled by um, physicians. But it was never really successfully um, under control because uh, we now see um, in some First Nations communities in Manitoba that there is again a rise in the rates of people who have it, the disease. And um, the argument is that basically um, the underlying conditions that um, kind of help to spread the disease and make it really um, virulent among uh, First Nations people still exist. So those conditions of poverty are still there. And until those are dealt with, then the disease is always going to kind of be, be around. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's basically my research sort of to date, I still obviously have a lot more to do. Reading the records of um, the sanatorium board would, will be very helpful. Um, but also, I, I don't know if you've noticed, but this has very little um, of the voice of First Nations patients who are in the institutions. And this is the hardest thing if you're a historian who relies prim primarily on archival evidence. There's, um, there's very little voice in there. So this is a history that that needs to be done um, in communities, in, um, in, in you know, interviews. Um, there are uh, community histories that different, different groups have put together. Um, those are really excellent places to look for information. Um, but obviously this is, this is not complete. This is a really a kind of institutional view of the history of tuberculosis.